This episode is brought to you by The Java Can, a ruggedized mobile coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's 10%. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. Live life charged. More people listen to podcasts than go to the movies on the weekends. So why doesn't your business have its own podcast? I'll tell you why. Because you don't know where to even start in the process. You don't want it to sound like you're recording in your mom's basement. And you simply don't have time to learn how to record, edit, and master the sound. Let ClearCommo take the stress out of podcasting and help you produce a high-quality podcast to share your company's message with its customers and future customers. If you're not in charge of your message, someone else is. So take charge today. Let us help you make a clear message with ClearCommo. Go to www.clearcommo.com and start your company's podcast today. Folks, the latest book on my must-read list is one that honestly might save your life. It's 365 Days of Survival by the folks at Captive Audience. This book has 365 days of tips and lessons of survival from people in the special operations world, law enforcement, and survivors. These tips span from wilderness to urban survival, natural disasters, and crisis planning. Be a force multiplier. 365 Days of Survival is available now on our website, theaarpodcast.com. Fortune favors the prepared folks, so don't wait to wish you knew what to do, know what to do with 365 Days of Survival. Go to theaarpodcast.com, scroll down, and order your copy of 365 Days of Survival today. And welcome to the show. On this episode, we're talking about something that has bothered me and intrigued me for some time now. Consultants. Now, when I got out of the Army active duty back in 2010, it felt like I entered a world of veteran consultants. Everyone was consulting on something. Experts with less than four years of experience. In some cases, they were promoting themselves as consultants. This trend seemed to have changed uh, over the last couple of years. And what we have today are a lot of coaches, advisors, but it's all basically the same verbiage from when everyone was calling themselves consultants. So what is it about being a consultant that is so alluring? It seems like folks really like that title. Is it movies where consultants are fast talking, money makers in expensive suits, solving problems and being the hero that keeps the company in business? Is it the notion that you have the ear of a CEO, a captain of industry, that you're important? I don't know. So I wanted to find somebody who could shed some light on this subject for me, somebody with experience, somebody who was a legit consultant, My guest today has been deeply involved in the world of business since he left the Army a while ago. Through hard work and experience, Jim White is comfortable with the title of consultant. But as you'll hear, we both have our concerns about how that term is used today. We talk about what you need to know before you decide to pursue a career as a consultant or if you're thinking about hiring a consultant for your business. So with that, ladies and gentlemen... Jim White. Hi, I'm uh, Jim White, and I'm a partner with uh, Harbor Pilots. Um, so uh, I joined the Army right after college, uh, so I was kind of a mercenary. I uh, went through ROTC. I really didn't have a great interest in being in the Army. I just wanted to figure out a way to get college paid for. Um, but so, so I went in, and I actually, what I did is I got myself branched into the Adjutant General Corps, which is really the administrative side of the army because I was trying to get myself kind of not too much into the army. Um, and, uh, I got myself assigned to Germany, 
Um, while I was in uh, my first gig, they because I had a sociology undergraduate degree, they thought that was social work, and they put me in Army Community Services. <laughs> and it took about about six months for the uh, the HHC company commander to pull me out of there when he realized. Like, I didn't even have a psychology class, you know. I, I knew nothing about social work whatsoever. So they pulled me out of that, and I became the, the, the S1 for a area support group. Um, and then I went on to be a uh, – I, I actually met my wife when, when I was in the Army, and uh, I went to Heidelberg, and um, and from there I was a uh, an executive officer of – I don't even think these things exist anymore – personnel service company, a PSC, or you, we used to call them MILPOs. Um, <clears throat> and I did that, and then I got out. Um, and, uh, you know, after I got out, uh, I was listening to one of your other shows and it was talking about that transition period. It was really hard because, you know, as an executive officer, you've got, you know, you got the, the staff of, the uh, you know, the supply sergeant, the armor and all that, and you're kind of second in command of the company. We had 300, uh, Milpo was the biggest company there was actually, we had about 300 people in our company. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so when you get out, you're like, that transition to everyone wants to start you at ground zero. Uh, so I ended up finding myself in a lot of sales jobs, um, which was really good. One of them I actually found on my way into was a, I was a, uh, a sales guy for Dale Carnegie, uh, for one of the, uh, the sponsorships in Chicago. And it was some of the best training ever. And it really helped me make that transition from, uh, kind of that military mindset, um, and, and, and it got me exposed to a lot of different people, the way they thought at, at kind of an intimate personal level, because this is like leadership training. It's a, it's the civilian version of leadership training with a real focus on communications, public speaking, human relations, that sort of thing. It was great. It was absolutely great training. I did that for about four years. Then I went to business school because I wanted to, you know, get into a big company. Right. Um, so I went to university of Chicago, uh, got my master's degree, my MBA. And then I, 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 I then spent the next 25 years in tech companies. So I worked at Nortel and then I worked at Alcatel. Alcatel merged with Lucent. So we became Alcatel Lucent and then Alcatel Lucent now is a company called Nokia. So, and during that time I did, I was really a product marketing, uh, you know, um, expert. Um, I was a vice president. Uh, you know, I, I, I did a lot of market development. I did a lot of a lot of portfolio management, that sort of thing. My last gig, I was the, running their connected hospital program. So we were trying to develop their healthcare vertical at Alcatel Lucent. And um, in that process, I met a couple of my partners that I have at this Harbor Pilots. They were guys at the Cleveland Clinic Innovations Group. Um, and we looked at the way people were bringing new products to market in the healthcare space because it's a, it's a space where there's a lot of opportunity for technology innovation. But the but the industry's kind of resistant to it. And we just thought there was a better way to do it. Um, so, so that's why we founded Harbor Pilots. And uh, so the concept behind Harbor Pilots, is, you, if you know what a Harbor Pilot is, are you familiar? No, with I'm, I have no idea. What so a there's a real pilot Harbor is. Pilot. We're not one of those. A, a Harbor Pilot's the guy who actually jumps on a boat when it comes, a ship, when it comes into a harbor. He knows the harbor and he pilots it through the harbor. The captain of the ship doesn't do that. Right. So there are these guys who, who do that uh, in harbors, like, you know, when you're docking them in a, uh, you know, a, you know, big industrial harbor like a Charleston or something like that. Oh, okay. So so the concept was, you know, when most people start a business. They're really focused a lot on the business being up and running and they don't pay that much attention to the transition periods of the business, like starting them up or transitioning them from one thing, from one kind of business to another, because almost all businesses have to pivot at certain points in time, right? And so, um, because we had worked a lot on starting companies up, I mean, these guys did it, my partners did it at the Cleveland Clinic Innovations Lab. They started about 80, 90 companies. Um, I did a lot of new product introduction during my, you know, 25 years in the telecom business. Um, and, uh, and so we, we felt like we had a really good handle on the process of, you know, of the beginning part of it, ideas, ideation, um, how much investment it takes, building the business model, the business case, understanding the marketplace, who's your first customer, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we built a framework around that, um, which we call a, a market alignment uh, program, which acronym when you, when you turn it into an acronym it's a map 
right? And a key part of the map is to create what we call these value trading points. And the idea is we visually, the way I think about it in the harbor is you have these buoys, right? And you go from one buoy to the next, and they might only be six or eight or 10 weeks apart, right? So that you, you kind of have this discipline of, you know, this is what we're doing for the next six to eight weeks, or maybe it's six months. It depends on how, how far, how long it takes you to get to each map, each, I mean, each buoy or value trading point as we call it. And the key here is that they're not just milestones. The, the, the trick is at, when you reach that point, you can trade, right? And what does that mean? So when I say you can trade, you, you can, you have a new product that you can sell to a new customer, right? So that's a trading point. Um, you have the company in a position where you can request investment. You have a team, you have met some criteria that get you to the point. You have first revenue. You have, you get to a point where you can go do a transaction, right? Um, so, um, so that's how we did it. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's our, that's, a, that's how we work with clients. And the trick here is, um, and one of the things I found as a consultant is actually nobody wants consulting. What they want is money. They either want it in new sales, right? They want it in investment. They, they want new money into their business. They want a new revenue stream. They want something. Nobody really wants consulting. They tolerate consulting. Um, and Why is that? What, what is it about that? The, it makes, you're making it sound like being a consultant is almost like a dirty thing. Is it, is it just... What, tell me about that. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, if they if they thought it was really intrinsically necessary for their business, they would have it in their business, right? So they it's 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 the you know when I hire a consultant, I'm interested in the end, which which is for whatever reason, right? So when we would hire consultants in our big companies, right, it was it was basically to get some kind of report to give to somebody inside to get them to make an investment, to allow us to uh, get rid of a group, divest something, whatever. And it's basically answering the question, who says so besides you, right? So you're using the consultant to accomplish something for you, right? Um, some value trading point. Um, and the same thing is true for every company, right? When they hire a consultant, it's, I need them to get me to somewhere I can't get myself. And it's almost always a financial thing. So it sounds to me like what I hear people describe themselves as when I hear them say, I'm a consultant. Um, what I hear them selling a lot of the time is their experience from their military life. So uh, I'm not trying to pick on my special operations folks, but I'm going to because a lot of I've seen a lot of folks come out of those industries and they market themselves as consultants based on their experience as members of the special operations community. I'm not even saying that like a lot of times they're not even operators. They're, they're support people, which is great. Everybody needs support. And I'm not taking anything away from that, but I'm not sure. I'm not personally convinced that, that, that it, that experience necessarily translates to business consulting. It sounds like they're, they're more business coaches or personal coaches because I, I don't see them bringing that type of value to say, like, I know all these people in your industry that I can bring money to or bring you their business. Yeah, you know, and there's different kinds of consultants. So, for example, there are consultants where, you know, I bring somebody in because they have expertise in a functional area that I, I don't have inside my organization, right? Um, for example, one of my partners is actually really good at medical device compliance process, right? A lot of small companies wouldn't have that in, inside their company. Right. So, you know, he's got that experience. Some of these guys could have some experience that would be, you know, very domain. Hey, I know something about a weapon system. OK, I don't have that experience. You have that. That's great. Um, I know something about a region. You have that. I don't have that, you know. Um, but I, I think that's pretty um, rare. I mean, yeah. I think what but, they're trading on, I, I do think what they're trading on is the fact that they're a rare, they're, they're using their kind of the elite, um, brand that they, that they think they have, whether it's because they're a Marine, you know, or they're, you know, like they're a green beret or whatever that, that somebody will value that. And some people might, right. 
Um, well, like, for example, what you were an intelligence guy, right? Right. So, you know, there are things that military intelligence guys do. Like, that intelligence function is actually a function that's probably better developed in the military than it is in a lot of corporations. And there, I could see a, a, you could make a pitch that says, hey, I can bring that to you. I can bring military style something to you. Um, it's, you know... Um, but it seems like a stretch. It seems like almost like unless I have a very specific or maybe if I brought an educational background to that. So I guess when I'm looking at some of these consultants coming out, especially, you know, you, you see them on LinkedIn and whatnot. What are you bringing to the table that's different from every other Joe that has left other than the fact that you're. Uh, trying to become a consultant or you're trying to, to, to bear that. I think that one of the things that a lot of these guys lack is experience. Um, you described your experience coming out of the military. You did a lot of other things mm -hmm. before you got to where you are now as a consultant or helping, you know, helping companies find their way through, uh, you know, finding the businesses that are going to help them grow. You had to go through, how many years would you say between where you're at now and when you left? Oh, 30 years 30 years did at what point did you say i feel like i'm a competent consultant i can consult and, and provide companies value return on their investment in me i mean there was a period of time when i was doing what i was doing inside the big telecom companies where where uh i could have done that mm -hmm. but I, I was never interested in consulting in that industry because i was i was already in the industry you know and i had yeah. a job and um i didn't see it as a way to make more money um, consulting's not a way to make more money. <laughs> I mean, tell me about that. Cause I, I don't think people may understand what you just said. Right. I mean, so yes, there are really, uh, elite consulting agencies that can command a really high, you know, rate per hour. Those are really rare and scarce. Right. Um, and, um, and, and they do that by having, you know, tremendous credentials, you know, everybody's from a top five business school and they're being managed by a partner who's done gigantic, you know, they have, you know, 25 years of experience. And, you know, and, and when you're talking about these big strategy consultant companies, you know, BCG, McKinsey, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so th that's a, that's, that's a real rarity. And I think that's what a lot of people think when they go into, into the consulting business. Um, for most people, it's if you're a company and you're hiring a consultant, you're you're basically looking at it as like, okay, one of two things. One is I'm going to bring this person in, um, and I'm going to pay them a premium because I don't want to have them forever, right? Because it's a short term, temporary thing. I don't want to hire this function. Um. Uh, to uh, you know, I'm going to bring this person in because they actually have a lot of experience I could never afford. So. It may be a slight premium over what that person could make working for somebody, but to that guy's, uh, to the to the client's perspective, I'm actually paying a below what I would have to pay somebody if I hired them, right? Um, usually, that's because you're doing some kind of fractional thing where you're, in, you know, instead of because I don't have forty hours of FDA compliance work for you, I've got ten hours a week, right? So if I hired somebody, I have to hire somebody. And now what do they do the other rest of the time? Right. Um, so, so I bring you in and I pay you a premium because I'm getting, you know, you, your fractional time. Now, from your perspective, what happens is there's these transaction costs to move between clients. And so you may say, well, if I, if I booked at this rate, 40 hours a week, I'd make a killing, but you won't. You're going to book at that rate at 25 hours a week because you're going to have to be looking for business all the time. And you're going to be, traveling in between and that's why you have to charge that higher premium and you know it could be a good compromise where if you have the right credentials and people buy into what you have to offer and there's a demand for it pretty consistently that hey you know what i can make in 25 hours of work a week what i would make in 40 and that works for some people right if they have a very specific high in demand kind of skill like clinical research right um you know but if you're like i'm doing what I would call kind of general business strategy kind of discussion. You know, it's really hard to prove that I have the credentials um, other than my experience. It's not, it's, it's not like, Oh, Hey, this guy has a PhD in this thing and he, 
he's an immunologist and he's going to go do, you know, do this particular very specific project, um, then, you know, that's a, like you said, I think that's what you're kind of trying to get at is, is that, yeah, if you have, if you have all the right credentials, you can probably pull that off. But if you're, you know, one of, you know, 300,000 NCOs leaving the army every year, um, you got to bring something unique to the table. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Really unique. Yeah. And, and, you know, what you, you said is, is very important to understand too, is you're, you may not be a graduate from a top tier business school, but you've also been in the world of business for 30 years. Right. You've been doing the job. You have that field experience, which is critical. Um, for a lot of veterans making that transition, uh, there could be a fascination or an infatuation, if you will, with the world of business. You see movies where like, you know, the suits and the ties and they're on private jets and they're, you know, they're consulting and, and they, they, they throw around the term consulting. I'm a consultant to a major company or I'm a, I can, I, I'm a leadership development guy for these famous people. Those are cool goals. Mm -hmm. Those are cool things to do. But how do you become those things? How how do you get your foot in the door to to those levels of of performance or to those to those levels of industry? Is it education? Is it just starting from the ground up? Uh, do you have to know somebody, or what? What's your advice to people who want to pursue those types of careers? Well, I think the I think the the best path in is basically your network. Right. So it, people will say, oh, hey, I knew Jim at this place and he did this thing already. Um, so I trust him to do that. Th at the end of the day, that I think is the ultimate thing. Do they trust you to do whatever it is they need done? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, and then I think the other skill that's really key, which is I think maybe not something that lines up um, really well with most people coming out of the military is salesmanship. Right. So if you can successfully connect the dots between what you did in whatever you were doing in the army or military and what these guys have and convince them that, for example, this intelligence idea that I had that said, hey, you know what? I can take this military style intelligence model that we used and I can apply it over here to your competitive intelligence stuff and bring something you don't have. If you can convince people of that. You can sell it, right? And then the next thing you have to do is deliver it, right? And then that's the, you know, does it really translate like that? Um, and, you know, and we, you know, at the end of the day, they have to come back and say, yeah, that was actually really un useful, unique information that I never got from the other guys who do it the way we normally do it in the business world. Where should they go to do that? Where do, where do you go to learn the salesmanship? Is it just YouTube? Is it just, you know, is there is there certain books you would say like, these are on your must read before you jump into these waters. Man, I'll tell you that, that, I, that is a, you know, that that's a combination of knowing what to do and being able to do it. And, um, and then being objectively honest about whether you really can deliver. Right. I, I actually think that's the first step. Can I really bring a value to somebody? And in order to even answer that question, you have to understand what that somebody's problem is. And that's where I think you're really, you know, kind of, challenging people like do you really understand what exxon's problem is i mean you've never been inside that organization you don't really have a grasp of all the internal resources and capabilities they have i mean some of these big companies have a lot of resources and they can tap consultants anywhere they want right um because they have big budgets and stuff like that so do you really understand that they have a problem it, if for example you can put your finger on something that convinces you that you know what i I'm, I'm convinced that they have a gap that with all their resources they have not been able to solve that i can solve if you really can come to believe that then you know that you should be able to identify that person who's experiencing that pain and it should be kind of a natural conversation, right, um, of persuasion. It just says, look, let me tell you a story. This is what I did in this. This is what I think you're going through. And this is the trick. If, if that person says, you just described my problem to a T, if you can do that, I think you got somebody paying attention to you, right? And they're saying, tell you what, well, what do you want? And then you have to figure out how to price it. 
what are some pitfalls of the world uh, in the world of consulting that you would advise people to be be cognizant or be look, be on the lookout for these things? Yeah, I mean, the number one pitfall if you talk to anybody who's in the consulting business is you get a gig, you work on it, the gig ends, and now you need your next gig. So you have to continuously be selling, or you're going to have these gaps. And so you know the you know the other you know how long does it take? for you to start an engagement with somebody, I mean, a conversation, and have that lead to a paying engagement. That could take months, right? For them to, you know, for them to believe, trust, feel the need, et cetera. Now, you can get to the point where you are doing things for people and everyone's lining up, you know? I've never seen that happen, but I presume that could happen. And, and, my, and I... I I know it happens in certain kinds of circumstances where, you know, the stars align, like some cybersecurity risk comes out and everyone's having it and you're the guy who knows how to solve it. Okay. You're going to have people just piling up. And someday though, you're going to have people showing up with other solutions to that problem and they're not going to, and they're going to find a cheaper, faster, easier solution. And they're not going to wait around for three years to solve a problem because they wait for you to come, you know? So and then the other part of it is scaling, right? I mean, if if all you're doing is selling your time, right? You only have so much time. And and the only thing you can do is either work harder, work longer hours, or attempt to raise your premium. And there's a there's obviously a ceiling on that. Tell me about how Harbor Pilots is engaging with their customer. What is it that Harbor Pilots brings to the table that is different, that is innovative? What, what's your ROI? What, what can we expect from an ROI by working with Harbor Pilots? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we, we started out, you know, doing more kind of traditional, you know, fee-for-service-y kind of stuff. And, um, and we still do that. But I, I think where we really have brought a lot of value is when we become very entrenched in, in our customers and their problems and bring to them solutions. So... Um, so for example, we had a customer who had a, uh, a product innovation in the pharmaceutical space. All right. Um, it was a process, not, not a pharmaceutical product. And, um, and, and, um, you know, we, we looked at their, their business model and we saw, Hey, you, you actually have a, a problem with your FDA regulatory path. All right. So we introduced them to a, another company that had a, they happen to be a 503B and they had a, um, which is a, uh, which is a compounding pharmacy that has a special kind of, they've, they've cleared some special FDA rules and there's only like 60 of them. And we drove a merger between the two companies, right? So, so now they have a natural FDA regulatory path. Um, not, and, and in addition to that, be, they were a startup with a new technology and they didn't have revenue. They brought, by doing this merger, they instantly, all of a sudden, are a revenue company because that company they merged with had revenue. All right, so so that's an example of, you know, of of bringing some the same client. One of the things we did is um, we said, hey, you know, you have two sides to this business. You have this pharmaceutical side, which is going to take some while, for, some time for you to be able to bring products to market. Pharmaceutical products require a lot of you know, you got to go through studies and things like that. And it all takes time. But they had the other side, which is nutritional, where it's more like supplements. And it's the same process. It's just different stuff goes in the pouch, right? We created a company for them, a consumer branded company. Um, and that's an Harbor Pilot company. Uh, it's a baby kicks, right? And so, um, and so we launched that. We built the company. We put it together. We launched it. We own it, right? Um, they supply us. And that's that's the product right there. So, um, so that's an example. Uh, another company is a, is a, was a company that's uh, been in the drone business. Um, and, uh, we work, we, we find we work with a lot of companies that kind of, um, they have a lot of intellectual capital. Um, they got kind of down the path. Um, and then they kind of get stalled. They get stuck in the Harbor as we call it. Um, one, one company licensed their technology to somebody who was going to bring it to market. Um, and the partner did their own internal business case after looking at it for a couple of years. And they, they decided that's not the best project for me to work on from an ROI perspective. So 
<clears throat> they stopped. So, but they had that product for three years, right? They had the, they had the, you know, the, the sole license for that product for three years. So then it got returned because that's the way the license agreement worked. So they got their little upfront fee, which is hardly anything. They really needed that company to bring it to market for them to get their license fees, right? And they didn't get that. So then all of a sudden they have the product back. That's where we stepped in and we were working with them. And, you know, we, we, we helped them on the business development side. I mean, these are all the things you do inside a big company when you launch a product, right? So for example, I would launch products at Elcatel. And what people, they always say, oh, just give it to the sales force. The sales force never sells the first product, right? Because that's just not how they're built right? You have to give them a sales prototype. So, so what ends up happening is the product management team ends up selling the first two or three products. That's, and that's kind of what, what, what we'll do for our clients is go in and, and, and part of that sales process, it's how it's going to be different from when you're actually in the marketplace with the product, you know, people want to buy is you sit there and you say, you sell it to them as if it's a thing, that's like hard and fast. And then they push back at you because they say, well, I can't use it because it doesn't have this. If I had that, would you buy it? Right. Only people in a product management kind of position can do a sales guy. Can't do that. Right. He can't make features happen in a product. Only the product management team can do that. And that's kind of our group's background is, is to, is to help people, you know, refine that final feature set that actually causes customers to buy it. Um, so, you know, that's our little niche, right? You know, um, and that, you know, that's the three of us all have that as our background is bringing products through the life cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, what people don't, what a lot of people don't realize is how long it takes to actually get a good product that goes out into the marketplace, right? It usually, t first of all, it almost always takes at least two or three revs of it. Um, like you might sell a few, but you, you may lose money on the first ones, or you may have bad customer experiences with it. And you got to kind of hand people, handhold people through it, make promises on the next generation, et cetera. So there's a lot, a lot of work to get, you know, the products that you're used to seeing that, uh, you know, that you really like and enjoy, you know, the exception to the rule is like Apple, Apple comes out and usually their product is pretty good, right? But look at Google products or Microsoft products. You know, when they first come out, they're pretty rough around the edge. I mean, that's why we always, there's a saying like, never buy the first edition of anything. Exactly. Yeah, it's really hard until you get it out there and you see how customers use it and they do things you didn't expect them to do with it or they, uh, they perceive the value completely differently than you expected. You know, you thought they were going to really think this was cool and it turns out they only want this, you know. Um, so, yeah, so that, and that's kind of where, where, you know, you know, that's the 30 years of background, right, of, of instinct. Now, the question is, it, does, does somebody come out of the military maybe have some of that, right? And if you think really hard and you can really bring something that says, you know what, I did, you know, this, and I've zigged and zagged and failed and succeeded and turned things around and... And, and if you can, if you have that experience and you can connect that to some commercial business, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, what I see a lot of military guys do is they'll, they'll lean in towards say government contractors or something like that. Um, and that probably is an easier fit. Uh, you know, I never did that. Although I'm I kind of getting dragged into it with this drone engine thing, right? I never was that interested in, in fact, so here's an interesting thing. Like our, our mindset is like, the, you know, uh, the military market is almost always too small for, for, to have a real impact. So, so, you know, one of our stories to these guys who had really been focused on DOD things is look, the real money is in the commercial applications. Um, the DOD projects are nice because they pay a huge premium for stuff that works in their unique environment. Um, so for example, these engines that we're talking about, they need small light engines that burn heavy fuels. That's kind of a military thing because of their supply chain, right? They don't want gasoline in their supply chain. So, you know, most light engines are gasoline. So how do I get a spark ignitable heavy fuel engine? These guys have one like 
millions and millions of dollars was invested in getting it there. But the commercial market could really value a light, heavy fuel engine in, in certain industrial places, right? And especially if it's multi-fuel, which this, this engine happens to be. So there's a, you know, that's the part of what we bring to it is this kind of lateral thinking about the marketplace. Because most people, when they're in a business, they get really super focused on their little, you know, the, the market they think it should go into. Um, in fact, I find that with myself, right? I've launched this Baby Kicks product. I was really focused on the, um, on the prenatal space, right? And, you know, one of the things I discovered is, wow, it's really hard to bring a new prenatal market product to, to moms because what I didn't realize was nobody wants anything that says prenatal on their pouch, uh, you know, on their product, unless they have advertised to everybody that they're going to have a baby or they're pregnant. And there's this, once they get pregnant, the first thing they do is they say, oh, I need a prenatal vitamin. Everyone knows they need it. They go find it. It's a nanosecond decision. And literally, they're going to get on the internet, and in about 15 or 20 minutes, they're going to anchor on a solution. And they're not going to find my product, right? So I, I realize I need to actually back up and bring this product to market as something else so that when I still want to have a prenatal solution because I think it's a great fit for that. But when, when the time comes, they realize, oh, I've been using this as my maintenance, fitness, you know, um, vitamin supplement every day. Why wouldn't I just go get their prenatal version, right? So, so the, and, and, you know, it's interesting to, to observe myself get caught in the same traps that I've talked my clients out of, right? It's so different when you're actually doing it. That's funny. It, it, what is that? The uh, the cobbler's children go shoeless or something like that. Like we we end up the victims of of the things that we are good at teaching other people, uh, but it's because we're so close to it. We're you're, you're you're in the woods, right? You can't you know can't see the trees from when you're deep 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 in there. Well, and and there's a I'm lot of a, jacked up my whole euphemism. I, think <laughs> I messed up that whole analogy, whatever. Well, there's a lot of emotion. Like when you're in your business, there's a lot of emotion that just fogs up your thinking. So, so for example, because of my experience with baby kicks, there was a, another client who I was working with. And quite honestly, you know, we told him not to do a few things, right? And he did them. And I, and, and we're like, ah, we're done with this guy and blah. After going through this, I came back with a lot more empathy. And I went to him and said, Hey, I'd like to take another stab at this. Cause you know what? I did things that I told you not to do in my own business because now I know why you did it. I understand now I understand better what drew you down that path, right? It isn't pure logic or, you know, I could say it all day long, but at the end of the day, I, you know, because, because of our model where we're actually kind of taking ownership for bringing things out there, we're, 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 we're like the product owners more, not just some abstract third party looking at stuff with a, you know, you know, um, I'm going to tell you what to do, but I've never done it before kind of thing, which, and, and which is weird for me because I did it a lot inside a big company, but it's, boy, it's so different when you do it as a manager inside a company than when you do it with your own money. Jim, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Do you have any parting shots for anybody? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> I should, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. So how can we learn more about, uh, Harbor pilots, baby kicks? Where do we go to learn more about all that and learn more about you? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, my LinkedIn, I'm Jim White, RDU, I think on LinkedIn. Um, that's a great place that connects you to everything. Um, and I love to connect. I'm a promiscuous linker. So uh, that would be a great place to start. But, you know, babykicks.com is, it's a, you know, it's a online store. You can buy the products right now. Um, and I would love to have any feedback, uh, Jim at babykicks.com. If you see something, if you think there's, and by the way, I'm looking for a partner there. Um, uh, one of the, here's a, you know, one of the experiences I've had is I realized um, in doing that one that um, I have a million ideas and I really struggle executing creative things, right? I've never, like, even when I was doing marketing jobs, people would come into me and they would talk to me about colors and what's the right word to use, you know, the tactical. And that I, I always had other people who I said, oh, you ask them. I don't know. 
And that's what's missing in from that business. And then um, you can go to harbor-pilots.com if you want to learn about Harbor Pilots and some of our clients and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, hit us up if you're interested. If you have a project, we'd love to hear from you. If you have, um, we're always raising money. If you have a lot of money, we, we'd love to hear about it. We've got great projects that are really investable that are, you know, they, um, you know, they, a lot of people don't know about them, right? They're they're good opportunities. We think they're hidden gems, diamonds in the rough. So awesome! Thanks for having me, Rod. Oh, I'm so glad you. Man, this is a great conversation, um, man. I, I I love when I have a conversation with with a guest, and I'm so overcome by all the thoughts and I'm processing everything that you said that I'm having a hard time being a good podcast host. Um, I, I want to ask you a ton of like questions that are very, very specific. Mm -hmm. and that could, we, we need two or three more hours. All right. That was Jim White. Great talk on consultancy, on consultants, what you need to know. And if you want to reach out to Jim or Harbor Pilots, all of those, all of those links are going to be in the show notes. So remember everyone, check out our sponsors, the Java can 365 days of survival. And of course, clear camo studios and if you're going to shop then shop vet owned businesses or mill spouse business too please go out there put your money where your mouth is don't just talk about supporting a vet owned business go out there and actually support them and while you're talking about you know supporting veteran owned businesses tell us what you think of this show by leaving a comment on any of our social media platforms we're on linkedin facebook twitter instagram and you better leave a five-star review on itunes okay maybe you shouldn't Maybe you don't have to, but it'd be great if you did. And I will see you at the next episode.